doing a stand-up routine. Uh, and if you don't do that well, you're, they're not going to pay much attention to you. And since my subject basically is a lecture, it's really important that I keep it interesting. So I'll tell you what I'll do. Let me pass these things around and try not to break them yourselves. <laughs> um, this one will pretty much illustrate what the point of them is. I showed them this, and I say, have you seen these things? Anybody seen houses being built? This is a scissor truss that's being built. Okay. And the main thing we talk about with trusses is stability, right? So we remove one triangle, and the whole thing falls apart. So they learn about triangles and stuff like that, and then they pretty much trash these things. Um, so I'm going to pass these around, if you guys can just move one down. And this, of course, Two kids have worn it around their neck. But whoops, this is to show that an arch bridge is the same thing as a parabolic shape of a suspension bridge. Okay. It also shows that the suspension bridge cable is flexible and the arch is not. And I'll tell you about that in a little bit. So pass this around as well. And they're really fascinated to know that the cables on a major suspension bridge that might be two and three feet in diameter are really made up of thousands of one-eighth inch diameter wires. Okay? And they're grouped in strands such as this. So once again, pass that around. So what I do, and I think what we're going to do here is just do a little bit of my fifth week of the sixth week. So basically I'm doing electric courses. Um, there's really very little else I can do. I try to make it as interesting for them as I can. This was an answer to a question that one of the kids had, of how do you anchor a girder to a post? But, so here, what I generally do is I say, we're going to build a bridge. It's going to go from west town to east town. And we have to establish where we put it. We go through the whole criteria as to why it goes, where it, where it goes, you know, the access of the roads on either side, the subsurface conditions, the narrowness of the river. Then we look at the various types of bridges. This is a beam and girder bridge, which basically, as you can see, it can handle a very heavy load. But the problem is you've got these piers in the river, which the navigation interests don't really like. So, so beam and girder bridges are not used pretty much for long spans. We talk about truss bridges, like that thing you're passing around. And I explained to them that one of the reasons that tr truss bridges are great, they're very strong, they can handle railroad traffic, et cetera, and so forth, but you, in order to build them, you have to put all this stuff in here. This stuff's called false work. I explained to them that this is basically the definition of overhead. The guy who you're building the bridge for has to pay for it, never gets to use it, okay, because the bridge will not support itself until it's completed. And then you go to... Now this is interesting. I just got done making a documentary film about this bridge. This is the Poughkeepsie, bridge, the Poughkeepsie Railroad Bridge, which was built in 1889, and it was taken out of use in 1974, but it's just recently been put back in use as something called Walkway Over the Hudson, which is a kind of like a rails-to-trails thing. So I show them this. This is a truss bridge, and you'll notice there's four piers in the river here. Okay, one, two, three, four. And then... We show them this. This is the Mid-Hudson Bridge, which is a suspension bridge. And you can see the Poughkeepsie Railroad Bridge upriver a little bit, but this one only has two piers in the river. So we talk about the ability of a suspension bridge to make much to handle a much longer span. This is the Hellgate Bridge. I should have got arrested for taking this picture because you're not supposed to take pictures from the Triborough Bridge, but I did anyway. Okay. <laughs> And we explained to them that the problem with an arch bridge is just like with a truss bridge. It's got a lot of advantages. It will take a very heavy load. It can give you a really big span. Uh, it's great for railroads because it's very stiff. But the problem is, just like with a truss bridge, until it's completed, it won't support its own load. So you have to go through all kinds of stuff like this. You see these tiebacks here? Okay, these are best because until that center connection that those two derricks are doing right now, until that's made, this thing will not stand up by itself. So again, there's all your overhead. Okay. This bridge is still, still being used by the way. Um, and then there's the Verrazano Bridge. This one annoys me. I took this with my cell phone. 
I've got a couple of Nikons at home that cost me four grand and they don't take pictures as good. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> um, okay, this is what our final bridge is going to look like. And establishing the air line, which is the line of the bridge. We'll go through this kind of quick. Borings and soundings are extremely important because you've got to know what you've got down below to take the incredible load that these bridges. The bridge that we design in class has a total load dead and live of 45,000 tons. So we have to talk about where you're going to put that load. So you have to do the borings and soundings. I show them these pictures. They all agree. They've seen this as they're riding around with their moms and dads. And that because we're doing this in the river, we have to probably do our borings and soundings from a, a barge or a ship. Uh, final surveys, we have to locate exactly where the anchorages and the towers go. And the point here, and this is not necessarily just for the kid, it's just for all of us, this is being done in the river. These dimensions have got to be exact because all the pieces of that bridge are being made, I always use the expression, some little old guy in greasy overalls someplace is making all the pictures and all the pieces that go into that bridge. And if these things are not located exactly where they're shown on the drawings, the pieces the guy is making ain't going to fit. And there's no way to fix that in the field. So they, it's a stress the importance of proper layout. Tower foundations. Here's our problem. We've got a river which is, you know, I don't know how deep it is. We've got a river. We've got a river bend which is all bushy stuff. You can't put anything on it. And here's the good stuff. So how do we do this? How do you get the load, how do we build that? It's in the water. Now, back in the old days before OSHA, this is how the Brooklyn, this is how the Brooklyn Bridge was built. The stuff I show in yellow, that's timber. The, these caissons were built in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. They were floated into the proper position at the East River, locked in place with this, which is called a coffer dam. This is, it can only go where you want it to go. And then, for a dollar a day, guys went down in there and literally dug the bottom out while up above people were piling granite blocks on top of it. So what they're literally doing with picks and shovels and whatever, they're digging out the bottom of that river to get down to where that foundation line is, which we established with our borings and soundings before. And this is what and this is what it looked like down there. We explained we explained to them that there was no electric light, there was no cell phones, no telephones, no diesel engines. This was all done with steam power and horses. Okay? And the thing you have to remember is as this thing is going down deeper, the water pressure is getting higher. You don't want the water coming in here because that wouldn't do anybody any good. So you keep increasing the air pressure inside until at some point they had between three and four atmospheres of pressure down there. And nobody understood about the bends at the time. So guys would finish their shift, get in the airlock, come on up, go to the saloon, and die. So about 15 or 16 people died of what was called caisson disease. You guys know that that's when the nitrogen bubbles come out of your blood too fast. Uh, the designer of the bridge, or the son of the designer of the bridge, Washington Roebling himself, almost died from the from caisson disease, working in the New York caisson, 70 feet below the river, surface of the river. There is a myth that Washington Roebling never walked on the Brooklyn Bridge, but that's not true. He did. He's an old man. And here's some more pictures of the way it was. There's the airlock, the top left. And again, the working conditions probably weren't all that great. Three bucks a day for non-Italians, one dollar a day for Italians. We're not going to do that. We're going to build our coffer dam this way. We're going to make steel pipe caissons. I know they look like beer cans, but that was the best I could do. <laughs> We're going to put our bridge, the one we're designing in our class with the kids, we're going to build, it, going to build our, uh, our foundations by using caissons. We're going to lock them in place with a coffer dam. And here's what we're going to do. We put 72 feet from the river surface to where the good stuff is, we can found this stuff. 
We're going to place the first case on, first steel tube, right where it's supposed to go. And then we're going to use a, a clamshell. We're going to start digging out the bottom. And as we dig out the bottom, it starts to sink. And the water starts filling up inside. You keep doing it until we get down to the, you call it bedrock, but it's not. The Brooklyn Bridge, for example, is founded on gravel on both sides. Okay. And then what we do, because concrete is heavier than water, the construction term is a tremi, uh, this concrete is heavier than water, once we get the case on the steel pipe down to the bottom where we want it to be, we start pumping concrete in, and that forces the water out. <coughs> and eventually, and by the way, I showed them that yes, you can pump concrete. Okay, most people don't think of that, but you can pump concrete just like you can pump water. And we talk about the fact that concrete is not, does anybody here, believe that concrete dries out? Yes, no? It doesn't. The concrete absorbs the water. The water goes into the crystallization. Everybody ever feel cement? You know, it's very fun, like talcum powder. Those are little crystals. And they absorb the water, and as they get bigger and bigger, they start to lock all the aggregate together. You don't ever want concrete to dry out. Okay, so concrete's heavier than water, we're pumping the concrete in, the water's coming out. And at the end of the day, we have the entire case unfilled with concrete, we have a solid foundation all the way to bedrock. Okay, we do that nine times. This is the actual foundation of the horizontal bridge, so you can see that this is exactly how that was done. I don't think anybody could get anybody to go down in a pneumatic case on anymore. Certainly not for a dollar a day. And let's see, so we put a cap on top of it, and then we have our two tower foundations and our anchorages. And then we talk about how much more time do I have to? Four minutes. Four minutes, okay. <laughs> so the anchorages, their function is basically to take the, 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 the tension in the cables. In a suspension bridge, all that vertical load is converted into tension in those cables. And here's what I do, and they love this. This is the one hands-on thing we do. I go to Home Depot and I buy a bunch of dowel sticks and I cut them up to this length and everybody gets one. And I say, okay, try to pull it apart. Put tension on it. Pull it as hard as you can. Can you break it? No. These are, little, these are fifth graders. Okay, now take it and push on it as hard as you can. Can you crush it? No. And then I say to them, okay, break it, we all do that. And that's bending. Bending is the worst way to use material, a stress multiplier. So the reason a suspension bridge works as well as it does is because all that 45,000 tons of load goes into the cables in the form of tension, and the function of these jobs here, okay, is to take and just use gravity to resist the pull. You see the cables coming into it on the top, okay? That's the function of the anchorage, to take that thrust. And here's the Verrazano bridge with all the individual strands going into the anchorage. <coughs> and there's our bridge, and we're going to do it. And then we erect the towers. This is interesting. I asked them, Brooklyn Bridge, this is the Brooklyn Bridge tower being built. And there's probably still guys digging down underneath this one. That's the Brooklyn Tower, this is the Manhattan Tower. I asked them, why is this stone? This was the last stone tower bridge built. Why? Then remember, the Brooklyn Bridge was the very first bridge to use steel. Up until that time, it was cast iron and wrought iron. The Brooklyn Bridge used steel, which was revolutionary, but they stayed with stone. The reason for that, they were used to it. They knew what it did. You know, it's different in science and engineering. Scientists make theories. Engineers go to jail when stuff doesn't work. <laughs> I'm a licensed professional engineer. You know what that means? If I screw up, I can be criminally charged as opposed to somebody who's not. Okay, so that's an interesting point about the towers. Let me show them some other towers. There's the Manhattan Bridge Tower being built about 20 years later. There's the Manhattan Bridge Tower without any cables. Golden Gate Bridge, Verrazano Bridge in New York. Oh, this is interesting because the Verrazano Bridge has such a long span of over 4,000 feet, they actually had to take into account the curvature of the earth. It's a 
So the tops of the towers on the Verrazano Bridge are an inch and five eighths further apart than the bottoms from the curvature of the Earth. And here's a, okay. And I think that's about it. I mean, you believe me, I could do this all night. <laughs> but anyway, that's that's what. I Do you build model bridges at all of the students? Oh, yeah. We, no, the students don't. I do. Um, I got an eight foot long model of a suspension bridge over at Laurel Ridge right now. And the kids are very respectful of it. They've only wrecked it a little bit. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So, how do you tailor something like this for kindergartners versus fifth graders? <laughs> what we did for kindergarten was I have a, I have a three, I have a six year old grand, granddaughter, and my my daughter told me, look, if you're going to deal with kids, you've got to do Dora the Explorer. So what we did was we took the, the troll, because the school, if you recall, the school was dealing with, um, with Billy Goat's Gruff. So I made a whole thing, and again, lecture, I had a whole thing of the Billy Goats on one side, and there was a bridge, and there was a troll under the bridge, and the bridge got washed out, so I used Photoshop, I took the bridge out, and I kept the troll. And then the question was, how do we get the kid, how do we get the goats across? And they came up with jet packs <laughs> and, and zip lines. And what's amazing, go on Google jet pack goat, you're gonna find a picture of a goat with a jet pack. <laughs> no, we did that, okay. um, and yeah, basically we did that, and then we decided maybe we ought to build a bridge. Okay, but we certainly didn't get into this level of detail. And then for my third week, again, as you know, I built 15 or 30 little struck little truss bridges. Kind of like that big one I passed around, but these were little made out of popsicle stuff. And I had three consecutive classes. The first class totally destroyed them. So I'm sitting out in the hallway putting them back together again, waiting for the second class, which I just barely did. By the time I got to the third class, I had a Starbucks bag full of rubber bands and broken sticks. <laughs> And the third class seemed to enjoy that as much as <laughs> But basically, you know, we, we got the concept of the function of a bridge is to get somebody from one side to the other. So that's, that's what we did. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm curious about the Sunshine Coast Bridge. Yeah. Um, is there a certain age that I think what I, what I do here at the presentation, I, did, I don't think it's going to work much more in the fifth grade. The first time I did it over at Pine Spring, after three weeks, I asked the teacher, do you think I'm going over their heads? And she said, yeah, maybe you are. But then the beginning of the fourth week, I said, okay, tell me what you learned. And they could kick back a lot. One thing I want to mention, I think somebody else has alluded to this too. When we were doing that thing, that the thing that you could wear around your neck, that arch bridge thing, um, when I was doing this over at Camelot, um, we're talking about the fact that a suspension bridge cables are flexible and they can move, whereas an arch bridge is rigid and it can't. So we're talking about what happens when the train is going across the bridge and the load is not uniform. This one kid, I could see it in his face, he had intuited a concept called, called local deflections, which is a graduate level concept in structural engineering in, in elastic theory. He didn't have the math, he didn't have the words, but he intuited the fact that the arch bridge was going to have to somehow do something different. And I thought that was amazing. Yes, sir. Tom, thanks for sharing your expertise and materials. You obviously put a lot of time crafting those. just wanted to ask you um, two questions. First, when you do the uh, field trip portion of the program, do you I'd actually love. take the kids to a bridge? I'd love to, but the, oh, okay. schools, the schools have said no. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> no, when, I, when I taught at NOVA, I used to take my structures class to the Arizona Avenue Bridge on the canal right up in Fletcher Boathouse, and they loved it, but the school kind of put the kibosh on that. I'd yeah. love to do it, but the school don't want to do no, it. No, that's great. Uh, and second was, um, you said that the only hands-on portion was the part where they snap the dowel. Yeah. Uh, and you still managed to keep the kids' attention throughout the, this lecture series? I mean, it's a pretty yeah. cool way of... Yeah, when I, um, I, I don't know about your other ones, but the one I saw, um, was basically this presentation expanded in more detail. But what I like about it is if you, we're all, we all need to do lectures sometime in our, uh, even though we focus on hands-on. But the graphics, 
the video, I've already seen the Galpin Gurdy Bridge. Yeah, and we've got that too. You know, the kids were enraptured by this presentation, I found. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, yeah but again, if we're trying to get kids enthused about science, you just don't want to stand up there and be a talking head because you're going to lose them real fast. But if you put something like this together, you can get some lecture in there. I've, um, I'll tell you, I've had some amazing feedback. Um, from kids who told me, like when I went back to uh, Laurel Ridge this term, I'd been there in the spring, and I've had kids from my previous class come up and say, I want to be an engineer. Wow. So, uh, like, like I say, I mean, again, I, it's maybe not very modest, but I, I, I think I do a good stand-up. And I think <laughs> that's, that's the only thing I could think to do with this subject. I mean, I can't push buttons and the wings. I can't do that with this subject. So it's got to be a lecture. You know, when I taught nights at Nova, I used to say the thing to do is to talk loud, keep moving, and tell dirty jokes, which you can't do with the <laughs> But that's where, where the teacher can come in, because I know for the kindergartners, they were trying to tie it to a project-based learning thing, where at the end they can build their own bridge of some kind, or tie it into geometry, or, you know, so I think that that's a good way to also have the teacher build on, on the task to actually make, for the hands-on portion, and actually use something. Okay, one more question or comment and then we'll move on. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, we didn't do it last year, but we had a, uh, a bridge building experiment with, the, with uh, third graders, actually. I was kind of surprised that it worked with third graders. Um, I don't know that much about third graders, but you learn. Uh, was, uh, we had toothpick bridges. We talked about very briefly a couple different types of bridges, had a little display, but we just focused them on the truss bridges. And what we did was we had a bunch of toothpicks, of course. And we had different materials they could choose from. We had gumdrops, starburst, and some sort of caramel of some sort, still in the wrapper. And they would choose how to build it, and then you know, they'd get groups of maybe two or three students each. And they would each then choose which one they which which material they wanted, and they they put a bridge together and we would test how many book wheels put them between a span. And they noticed that you know some materials they chose didn't work as well as others. So we ended up with two classes, like the ones that did the gum jobs were able to hold three books, and the ones that used the starburst could hold like eight books, you know, or something like that. Yeah, that's, that's but that, that's one possibility yeah. in the future. Well, when I did do this term, and it, um, I said, all right, take home two sheets of construction paper, make a bridge. Ooh. And what I did was cut one of them in half and make two cylinders, and then take the other one and fold it so it had like, you know, deep ridges. And that would, that would support that would support stuff. But what I got was a lot of kids who took two pieces of paper and made suspension bridges out of them, okay? <laughs> um, but, my, you know, look, I mean, it, it's a conscious decision on my part that I'd really rather, if I can keep their attention, which I seem to be able to do, uh, I, I, I just, I'd rather just hit them with as much of this stuff. And what I'm getting back is, like, I'll come in and they'll say, we went to Ocean City last week, and I saw a suspension bridge and a couple of truss bridges, and, you know, so to me that, that's, that, that's cool. And when you see the light bulb goes on over their head, that's what makes it all work out. Thank you, John. Thanks, Professor Core. Thank